Well, first off, I uh, just want to say thank you all so much just for having us and for allowing us to serve as an extension of the Covington Bible Church. Um, we, in what we're doing, um, being, trained as, um, go, being trained as missionaries, Maho's still going through the training out in Missouri, uh, we get to meet a lot of different missionaries from a lot of different places and hear their stories, hear about their relationship with their home church. And I have to say that the more we hear about other churches, the more and more grateful we are for the Covington Bible Church. Um, I just thank you all so much just for being such an awesome church family and just for your faithfulness. It, it is truly a privilege to, to be missionaries uh, with the Covington Bible Church. Uh, before I get going, I'm just going to go ahead and pray, and then we'll get going. Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for the privilege we have of knowing you and calling you Father. And Lord, I just pray that you would give me your words to say. Lord, you would keep me out of your way and just that your truth would be clear and that you would be glorified. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's, it's always really interesting uh, just seeing how the Lord um, makes, takes the songs in the service and lines them up with, with what I'm going to share. Almost every time I've shared, it always ends up happening. And I've, I've yet, I think I've yet to request a song, but the Lord always seems to work things out. Um, I love the words to that song where it talks about, you know, in these times of de desperation, when, when everything seems dark. And, and I don't know about you, but over the past five years, it seems like things have gotten a whole lot more desperate and a whole lot darker. Um, it just seems like every time you turn on the news, every time you talk to somebody, you hear about more darkness. And our society and our world are more and more desperate. Um, you think about five years, just how much the world has changed in the past five years. Uh, five years ago, I don't think any of us would have ever imagined desperately driving between Walmart and Food Line trying to find toilet paper. On the serious side, we would never have imagined a worldwide pandemic that cost the lives of over six million people and has completely redefined what normal life looked like for two years, and we're still getting over it. Um, we have seen more and more just the complete and utter bankruptcy, the more complete and utter moral bankruptcy of our society, just as we see more and more evil on every front, not just out there, but in here as well. Um, just think, how many key church leaders have you heard about over the past five years who have fallen into to gross sin, have either embezzled money, been unfaithful to their spouses, or completely walked away from the faith? How many of you can think about people that you grew up in church with that are no longer here? People that you might have been in youth group with, people that you might have attended church with for years who, who are no longer walking with the Lord. As if that weren't enough, we have the threat of World War III that is seems to be more and more imminent and something that is no longer conjecture, but is a possibility. We have a society that is increasingly hostile to our faith, to what we believe, and we have the threat of, economic, of an economic collapse that is, you know, every time, it's getting a little bit better now when you go to the gas pump, but it's, our receipts from Walmart are a lot more painful than they were a few years ago. Um, and, and as we face these things, um, you know, it's, it's really easy to la begin to let fear govern everything that you do. And I know for me personally, over the past several years, fear has been one of the most constant personal battles that, that I've had to deal with in my walk with the Lord. As you begin, and it, it'll look slightly different for each and every one of us, but um, it's really easy to start falling into, into what ifs. Well, well, what if there's an economic collapse? What if things get really bad in the States? You know, 
How many people are really going to be interested in supporting missionaries? You know, what's going to happen to us? What's going to happen to our, to our support level if, if things get really bad in the States? Or, or just, just fill in the blank for whatever it is in your life, in your work, in the setting that you find yourself. You know, we're really, really good at, at asking, you know, what if? And just as we look at how bad things are getting, how dark things are getting all around us. And, and that raises the question, how are we as followers of Christ supposed to live in light of a world that seems to be falling apart all around us. And, you know, there's, there's several different things that we as Christians will oftentimes do um, in response to this. There's, there's four different reactions that we, that we can have. One of those is to conform. We just become like everyone else around us. We've all known people who, I mentioned earlier, who have walked away from the faith and now look exactly like people from the world. Make no claim to be Christian, and their life has no evidence of a relationship with Christ. We can become exactly like the world. We can conform. The one I tend to struggle with the most is to just keep silent. And it's, it's, that one's, that one's a, lot, a lot slipperier to deal with. Because I may not compromise my moral integrity in my own personal walk with the Lord, but it stays exactly that. It only stays personal. And it may be that you have a good family, you love your wife, you bring your kids to church, you have your personal devotions, but the people who know you at work or in your hobbies or at school would be surprised to find out that you're a Christian because you've never opened your mouth and shared what you believe with the people around you. And it's, you know, the most convincing lies are the ones that have a little bit of truth mixed in with them. And we can convince ourselves that, well, you know, my, my testimony is going to be what wins people to the Lord. And that's a lie. It may draw their attention, but if we never open our mouth, if we never speak, which is the way that God has commanded us and the way God has ordained that his word is spread, if we never open our mouths, they will never know. They may see us as good people. They may see us as pillars in the community. But if we never open our mouths, they'll go to hell with that impression. Because we never shared what we believe. We never gave them a reason for the hope that we have. Another option is we can withdraw. We can just retreat. Try to stay as far away from the world as we possibly can. And that's another temptation when things start getting really bad. In the Middle Ages, if you study church history at all, there was, in the, at the end of the Roman Empire and going into the Middle Ages, there was a tendency in the church for people who loved the Lord and saw as society got more and more corrupt to just withdraw, form their own little communities, and completely cut themselves off from society as a whole. And that's where we get the different monastic orders that you see in the Catholic Church today. And now, I don't think any of us are, are in any danger of running away and joining a monastery, but I want to be careful here. But we as Christians sometimes can be very good at just completely separating us as much as possible, ourselves as much as possible from the world. I was homeschooled, so again, I want to be careful here, but there is a branch in Christianity that we don't put our kids in school, because of the dangers there. We don't go out into society because of the danger, because of how evil things are. We form our own little tight-knit groups. We don't know any, we don't really have any kind of a, a close relationship with anyone from the world because, because that's dangerous, because there's darkness there. And we completely separate ourselves from any chance of the world actually getting to see how we live and having, and, or have a chance to hear us talk about the one who has changed us and made us different. All that's, and again, these are, some of these are, are really subtle and they can feel really right, but it's a strategy of the enemy to keep us silent and to keep us ineffective. Another thing that Christians often do is when we feel threatened, when we feel afraid, when we see darkness, disorder, 
and chaos around us is we attack. And uh, I just want to make sure we're clear on this. The best way that you can change someone's heart is with a scathing post on Facebook. That's the absolute best way to change someone's heart. Now, we, we can laugh about this, but how often have we done it? See something we don't like? Something that is morally wrong, something that is evil? We'll post about it, and we'll sit back and feel like we accomplished something because you know, we, we spoke the truth. Now, the, the speaking the truth and love part was completely forgotten, but you know, we, we, we shared truth with someone. You know, we, we let them know good and well what we believe and what we think. But that reaction was based out of hate and based out of fear, which puts us firmly on the enemy's playing ground when we respond in that way. And all of these things are fueled by fear. And when we talk about fear, um, there's, there's something that's kind of important to understand. There's a difference between the emotional reaction that we have when we see something that is alarming, when we see something that happens in society or something in our community that, that, scared, that is scary. It is a normal human reaction to feel fear when we see that. The difference is, is when we allow that fear to dictate our action and we begin to act based on the emotion that we feel. There are a lot of things that we see that, that we don't want to deal with. There are situations we see that we don't want to enter into. There are realities that we think about as we look to the future and we do not want to enter into those. I don't want to live in, a, in an economic collapse. I really don't want to live in World War III. And that is a normal thing to not want to go through something like that. But we need to process through these things. Um, in Psalm 56, verses 3 and 4, um, the Psalms are full of, of verses like this. I'm just picking this one. Psalm 56, verses 3 and 4, it says, When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? Uh, you see what the psalmist is doing there? What David is doing is he is expressing, okay, there are times when I am terrified. There are times when I am scared. But when I feel that, I take that to the Lord. When I am afraid, I will trust in the Lord. You see, there's, there is a cycle. There is a process that we go through when we feel an emotion that is not godly, that, is not, that does not draw us towards what the Lord wants, we can either allow that to govern our actions or we can take it to the Lord and trust Him with it. Jesus was fully human. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, in the book of Luke, Jesus did not want to go to the cross. In Luke 22, uh, verses 42 through 44, the Bible says that Jesus was in the garden praying and he did not want to go through what he knew was coming. And he knew, unlike us who, you know, we think about things that might happen, Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen. He knew that he was going to suffer more than any human being had ever suffered or would ever suffer and that he was going to be separated from God the Father for the first time in history. And Jesus did not want to go through that. Jesus said in verse 42, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven and strengthened him. And being in agony, he prayed earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. The Son of God was stressed. He did not want to go through what was coming. But he did not allow what he was feeling to govern how he reacted. He prayed. He took that to the Father and he said, Not my will, but yours be done. 
And I'm convinced that as we, as we deal with our fear, that is the example that we have to follow. It is normal for us to feel fear, for us to not want to go through difficult times. But we need to take that, bring it to the Lord, and not allow it to govern our actions. That, that's the difference there. Um, the enemy loves playing with hypotheticals. He will what if us into an early heart attack if he can. Um, I'm really bad about this. I'll think, well, well what if this happens? What am I going to do if this happens? You know, what I mentioned earlier. Or what if, you know, there's a, there's a, world, a world war breaks out and I'm stuck in South America. You know, what's, what's that going to look like? Or, you know, you just, we can what if so many different scenarios. And the enemy does that. So that we will use our energy and our time and our emotional strength and energy and we'll focus on things that are completely unreal and quite possibly will never happen. And we completely forget about what it is that God has for us today. The enemy's playing ground is the hypothetical, not the concrete. And as we deal with this, um, Something I've, I've come across, again, going back to Psalms, this time we'll be in Psalm 46. Um, just as, as we deal with times when, when things are falling apart. In Psalm 46, starting in verse 1, it says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, that the mountains tremble at its swelling. Do you see what the psalmist did there? He is not saying, what if? He is saying, even if. And there's a very big difference between what if and even if. He says, even if the absolute worst thing happens that I can imagine. He talks about, you know, the world literally physically falling apart, you know, mountains falling into the sea, the world completely melting and disappearing. Even if this happens, this will not change who God is. This will not change that nothing happens without the direct authorization of a God who is infinitely good and if infinitely sovereign. And if we are going to deal with our fear, we must anchor our fear of the hypothetical in the concrete of God's sovereignty and his goodness because he is both totally sovereign and totally good and there is nothing that will ever happen that is outside of his control that he will not use for good and as we think about this you know the worst things that could possibly happen have already happened we go back to Genesis. God created a perfect world, made human beings in his image and had a perfect relationship with us. Satan failed at his rebellion in heaven and succeeds in corrupting God's perfect creation and separating God from the creation that he made in his image and that he deeply loves. At the time, this is the worst possible scenario that we can imagine. And what does God do? He takes what seems to be a defeat and turns it on his head. Instead of wiping out the human race, he puts into, he puts into action his plan to redeem mankind and to show Satan that even after taking his best shot, he is still utterly defeated. We look at the flood. The world has gotten so corrupt that in order to save mankind, God completely wipes out the entire human population except for eight people. Again, taking what Satan meant for evil and giving humanity a fresh start. And the absolute worst thing that can ever be imagined is God coming to earth in the form of a man in order to save humanity being betrayed by one of his followers and killed in the most violent, painful way imaginable. There is nothing worse in the universe that could happen 
than the Son of God being killed by his creation. And what does God do? Right? Takes the worst thing that could ever happen in the creation and turns it to be the greatest hope, the greatest miracle that could ever happen. Takes the evil and turns it on his head. Nothing. All the worst things that can, that can happen have already happened. And God has shown that he will take the absolute worst thing and turn it into something incredible. Something that, we, that humanity could not have possibly imagined prior to that. And as we, as we walk, um, it's, it's easy to forget. It's easy to lose sight of these things. And one of the things that God in his mercy has done is he's given us many different examples in the word of God of people who have faced incredibly, different, diff- incredibly difficult times and have continued faithfully even though the world seemed to be falling apart all around them. Um, uh, one of the ver- passages that's been um, really encouraging me, encouraging to me through, through all of the things that are happening around us has been the story of Daniel and his three friends. Um, so if you want to turn over to the book of Daniel, that's where we'll be um, for the rest of the time this morning. Um, in Daniel 1, verses 1 and 2, it says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then he commanded Aspenaz, the chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of the Israel, both the royal family and nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance and skill, full of wisdom, endowed with knowledge and understanding, learning and competent to stand in the king's palace, and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. And this is where Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, find themselves. And you know, these, are, these are historical accounts that we've grown up hearing in Sunday school. And they're some of the most well-known stories in the Bible. And so it's, it's really easy for us to just kind of gloss over them and, and not really think about what exactly was the reality that these people were living in. Um, for Daniel and his friends, uh, they were probably between the ages of 15 and 17, so... Um, not quite out of high school yet. And the reality that they, have, they are living in right now is um, the first several years of their life have been under the reign of King Josiah, who was the last good king of Judah. And they would have seen what seemed to be a, a spiritual bright spot um, as Josiah is restoring the worship of the true God and having a Passover and teaching his people who God is. But then Josiah is killed at a very young age in battle. And uh, the king of Egypt, after killing Josiah, puts his own king, puts a different king on the throne um, of his choosing and imposes a very heavy tax on the people of Judah. Judah then goes on to become a client state of the Babylonian Empire, which is the, the rising star on the world scene at the time. And after three years as a client state, the king of Judah chooses to rebel against Babylon. This rebellion is crushed. And in response to the rebellion, Nebuchadnezzar comes and not only takes the treasures out of the city, but he also picks the best and brightest of the youth from uh, the Jewish nobility and the Jewish royal family and takes them to Babylon, where they are going to be forcibly indoctrinated in everything Babylonian. They are going to learn Babylonian. They are going to learn the culture, the language, and they're even going to get their names changed. That's, that's the reality that they're in. Now, just, I'm just going to try to put this in today's terms. Imagine that the U.S. has suffered a major military upset against Russia. As a result of this, Putin picks the next president of the United States. U.S. becomes a client state to China in order to get some form of protection. Decides to try to rebel against China. This rebellion is crushed. As a result, Chinese come in, take whatever they want from the U.S., including the best and the brightest from the schools across the nation, 
and you are taken to communist China where you're going to learn Chinese, you're going to learn the culture, and you are going to serve at the pleasure of the Chinese government. That's about the reality that Daniel and his friends find themselves in. It would, it would be difficult to think of a worse situation to find yourself in. Uh, think of yourself, not quite having finished high school, and you find yourself in this situation. What chance do you think you would have to have an impact for the Lord in that kind of a situation? What chance do you think you would have to, to be faithful to what you believe? How in the world do you think God could use something as terrible as that? What do Daniel and his friends do? The first test they face is um, one of the things that the king does is he gives the, the Jewish prisoners a, a portion from his table. So they get some of the best food in the empire, but there's a problem. See, this food has been offered to idols, and a lot of it would go against the Jewish dietary laws. So what did Daniel and his friends do? Now, you think of what the, the most insignificant thing to try, to try to take a stand on. It's, okay, we're in a life-threatening situation. Everything we know is lost. Quite possibly our families have been killed. We're in a foreign country. We're being indoctrinated. And we have to eat some food that God tells us not to eat. Is that, really wor- is that really a rock worth dying on? Is that really something significant that we need to worry about? What do Daniel and his friends do? They very respectfully, instead of just conforming and knuckling under and flying under the radar, they very respectfully go and ask permission to, to be tested. And say, okay, well, so just, just, we, don't, we don't want to violate what God has told us, so just give us vegetables for 10 days. At the end of those 10 days, you see, God honors this choice that they have made to try to follow God, and they look better and are better equipped, better equipped mentally than all the rest of the prisoners, all the rest of the people that are presented to the king. And I'm going to move pretty quickly through this, but I just I want to highlight a few things. Um, next chapter. King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And no one can interpret what this dream means. So the king, out of frustration with um, the wise men and the soothsayers that he, is, that he has in his court and who are unable to interpret this dream, orders them all executed. Daniel and his friends pray and Daniel is given the interpretation of the dream, and Daniel is, is very, very careful to give God the credit as he, is, as he is explaining the interpretation of the dream to King Nebuchadnezzar. And again, this is a pretty risky thing to do because this is a king who worships idols. And here's Daniel who is, you know, brought before the most powerful person in the world at this time and makes it, you know, and it, but he's still very, very careful to give the credit to God. You know, he's... Make very careful to say that you know, God is the one who has given the interpretation to this dream. We have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, refusing to bow down, even though they know good and well what the punishment is. And in the refusal, they are, they are very respectful to the king, and they say, you know, God is able to deliver us from this, but even if he doesn't, know that we will not bow down. We will not dishonor God by worshiping this idol that you have set up. The stories go on. We have Nebuchadnezzar losing his mind, and instead of gloating in the fact that God is going to judge Nebuchadnezzar for his pride, um, Daniel reacts in concern. Um, Nebuchadnezzar gets a dream in which God warns him that because of his pride, he is going to lose his mental faculties for a period of time. And when Daniel receives the interpretation of the dream, he says, Then Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, was dismayed for a while, and his thoughts alarmed him. And the king answered and said, Belshazzar, let not the dream and the interpretation alarm you. Belshazzar answered and said, My lord, may the dream be for those who hate you, and the interpretation for your enemies. You see, Daniel is, is instead of responding in hate, and anger towards the person who has caused so much suffering for his people and has removed him 
from everything he has known, he responds out of concern for the person who has caused this. Later on, when the, the Medo-Persian Empire conquers the Babylonians, we know the story of Daniel in the lion's den, when the king gives an order that no one is to pray to any god except him. And Daniel chooses to continue to pray publicly to God. And, you know, you always, I always kind of wonder, like, why didn't Daniel just, you know, pray inside? Why did he have to go and pray in a place where he could very easily be seen and be reported to the king? He chose not to hide, not to withdraw, but to remain faithful to what God had called him to do. And what was, as we look at all this, um, we, we need to ask, what was, what was the result of, of Daniel's faithfulness, of the decisions that Daniel and his three friends chose to make? First off, we have two world empires that had a very clear, clear testimony of who God was. They had personal, they had two, had, well, no, yeah, two world empires and several kings who had a very, very personal witness to who the God of the Bible truly was. We have very, um, in the book of Daniel, we have very specific prophecies about world events for the next 400 years and beyond. Prophecies that are so specific that Daniel is, um, critically, is the most attacked, one of the most attacked books in the Bible. We have prophecies about the exact year that Christ is going to enter Jerusalem. And something else that is, is really, really neat that you have is uh, the change that you see in King Nebuchadnezzar during his interactions with Daniel. Um, I'm just going to highlight a few of these. Um, in Daniel 2, verse 47... Um, this is right after um, Daniel has interpreted the dream for King Nebuchadnezzar. The king answers, Truly your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. You have been able to reveal this mystery. First, Nebuchadnezzar sees that this God is, is different from every other God that he's ever met because this God actually has power to interpret things that no other God has been able to interpret for him. When Nebuchadnezzar is getting ready to throw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fiery furnace. He famously utters the phrase, and what God is able to deliver you out of my hands? His response after God rescues the three out of the fiery furnace is found in verse, um, in verse 29 of chapter 3. It says, Therefore I make a decree, any people or nation or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be torn limb for limb and their houses laid in ruins. For there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Again, he sees this God is different from every other God that he has ever known. And then we go to get to chapter 4, where Nebuchadnezzar has his dream and is humbled before the Lord, loses his mental capacities for several years. And we see what he says in verses 2 and 3. He says, it has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. Then we have in verses 34 and 37, um, near the end, he says, At the end of days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say, what have you done? This is the same guy who earlier in his life had said, and who is the God who is able to deliver you out of my hand? You see the impact that Daniel's life and the testimony of his friends had. You see, and I, as you read this, it, I think there's a very good possibility that, that we will see Nebuchadnezzar in heaven just based off, off, what, off the things that he is saying here, of, of what he has come to know and believe about the God of Israel. And all of this happened because four Jewish teenagers chose to eat their vegetables. 
something so small and so insignificant, the world has fallen completely and totally fallen apart. They have no idea what's going on, what's going to happen, but they know one thing. We know that eating this food that the king has brought us would be dishonoring to God. Again, this is something so small, so seemingly insignificant in the scenario that they find themselves in. We have no idea what's going on, but we know what God wants us to do today. We know, we know that God wants us to eat our vegetables. And we see how God takes that to put these four at the forefront and then uses them to be a witness in two world empires and to change the heart of the most powerful man in the world at that time. And as, just wrapping, as we wrap up and as we look at living in a world that is getting darker and darker every day, and we, begin, and we think about the challenges that we are facing and will face to our faith, to our walk with the Lord, um, one thing that, that has helped me a lot is just to keep in mind that God is not calling you to a lifetime of faithfulness today. God is calling you to be faithful today. And there's a difference. You know, we can think about how overwhelming it's going to be to try to live a whole life pleasing to God. But that's not what God's calling us to. God is calling us, what do I have for you today? How do you, I want you to be faithful to me in what you know is happening around you and what is actually in front of you today. You know, we can, we can get all wrapped up in knots thinking about, well, what will happen tomorrow or, or what will happen next week or next year or 10 years from now. But we have no guarantee of that. And in Matthew 6, um, the Lord Jesus tells us to not be anxious for tomorrow because tomorrow has enough worries of itself. And, and God, is, God is so merciful because what he's doing is he is giving us permission Focus on today. Because that is the only thing that we have to worry about. That's the only thing that's actually concrete. What are you actually dealing with today? That's all you have to worry about. How can we be faithful to God and what he has brought, uh, brought before us today? And that's it. That's what God's calling us to. To remain faithful to him and what he's given us today. That may be having devotions with your kids tonight before you go to bed. That might be taking five minutes to share the gospel with someone while you're hanging out at Dalton this afternoon. It may be something different for each and every one of you. But the, what the thing that God is asking, calling us to, the thing that God wants from us is faithfulness for today. We don't have to get ourselves all wrapped up thinking about you know, all the possible scenarios for economic collapse and all the terrible things that could happen, what God is calling us to is how can we remain faithful? How can we honor him and what he, what he has put before us today? And that's it. Father, thank you so much for the privilege of sharing your word. Thank you for the fact that we can call you, call you Father. And Lord, I just pray as we go out through the rest of this week, Lord, that you would just help us to remain faithful with the things that, that you've called us to. And you would help us to not be anxious about um, the future or the things that can happen. That, just that we'd be focused on serving you and, and honoring you and what you've given us today. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen.